Hello everyone. Welcome to the University of the Witwatersrand in Johannesburg, South Africa. I'm Lee Berger, a professor in paleoanthropology here at the university. I'm also an explorer at large for the National Geographic Society. Because of the extraordinary circumstances occurring around the world due to COVID-19, we at the university decided to do something special. We decided to give you a behind the scenes tour of this extraordinary fossil hominid vault. Inside of this vault are some of the most precious fossils related to the origins of humankind. We hold here something like over 50% of the entire record for human origins known on the continent of Africa. It's a very special place. Only scientists generally get inside of here. But over the next several months in a series of lectures, I'm going to be taking you on a tour of the collections and special hominid fossils and some of the special historical artifacts related to those that we hold here. These will be original fossil hominid demonstrations, and I hope they're of some interest to you and also of some use in those that are having to do classes around the world via mediums like this. Now, I apologize up front because due to the exceptional nature of the events happening, I'm having to do all of the filming, all the audio, and all the editing myself, so it'll be a little bit rough around the edges, but I hope you enjoy. And so, to begin with, before we look at the Tong child itself, let's talk about where the Tong child was discovered. Tong is located about 400 kilometers or 250 miles to the west and a bit south of Johannesburg. It actually forms on what's called the Kalahari Escarpment, and it's a huge tufa flow. Now, tufa is a, a thing that forms actually when uh, water at normal temperatures, they're super saturated with calcium carbonate, flow over cliffs or, or sharp edges, and they deposit the lime in, in huge deposits. And the Tong site itself really is an enormous deposit. The bedrock behind it's dolomite, that's where the calcium carbonate comes from. And the tufa has formed was, was a rich source of lime. And so uh, a few years before the discovery happened, somewhere around 1916, 1918, the Tong site opened as a quarry site to serve the need for lime in the building industry and in the gold industry uh, that was booming around Johannesburg. And so miners began blasting this, this huge tufaceous deposit. And when, when I say huge, it really is. It's almost uh, two kilometers or, or just over a mile uh, long, this deposit, and, and probably almost a half a mile or more in places wide. So it was a really rich source of lime. The miners uh, were blasting away through this, and sometime prior to 1924, uh, the quarrymen began discovering fossils, and, and one of these fossils ended up in the quarrymen's uh, head office. And in 1924, a, uh, a director, an actually visiting director of the Northern Lime Company, um, and that's, by the way, where the term Norlam comes from, and you'll see that uh, on the maps as we look at the site, uh, which just simply stands for Northern Lime Company, uh, saw one of these primate skulls and actually asked for it. Uh, that was given to uh, his son, Pat Izod, uh, and his son put it on a shelf, on a mantelpiece above the fireplace. It was then that one of those great coincidences happened. A, a young student named Josephine Salmon, she was a medical student, and in fact, she was the first female medical student of the young professor Raymond Dard at the University of Vivaldersram, was friends of the Izod's and visited and saw this primate skull. Now, she knew that Raymond Dart, a comparative neural anatomist, was intrigued by skulls, and so she asked if she could take it to Dart back in Johannesburg, and she was allowed to. It ended up with Dart, and Dart was intrigued by it and contacted uh, both the Izod's and then the Norlam Lime Company to say if they found any more fossils, could they send them to him? 
Uh, that started off a chain of events that would make history, of course, because a young geologist, a consulting geologist for the company, made a collection of some of the more interesting fossils, at least he thought, uh, that he had, had been discovered at the Tong Quarry on a visit there. And he boxed them up into a big wooden crate and he sent them to Raymond Dart uh, in Johannesburg. And they arrived in Dart's home in November of uh, 1924. And it was ironically the very day that Dart was going to actually serve as a best man at his best friend's wedding. And there was evidently much consternation with his wife as he opened up the box and started sorting uh, through these things. And, and that's when he, he saw a, a remarkable block. Before we get to the Tong child itself, uh, let me show you some of the neat things we have here related to the history of the discovery. Um, this is a bust that was made by an artist back in the 1930s. Um, you can see it has lovely flowing locks of hair as a, as a very early attempt at the reconstruction of what the Tong child would have looked like uh, when it was alive. Um, this object is actually the box that Raymond Dart used to transport the Tong child uh, when he took it to London, even in the original plastic bags inside of it. This is the box that Raymond Dart uh, blamed his wife for leaving in the back of a London taxi cab with the Tong child in it. It was luckily recovered. I guess taxi cab drivers were pretty honest at that time. And luckily it has come down through the years unscathed. We no longer transport the Tong child in this box. It has its own special case uh, that it transfers in uh, when it's not sitting here in the lab in this uh, armored protected case. Um, this block is a reconstruction that was done by Ron Clark back in the 1980s. This is a, a facsimile, because we have no pictures from Raymond Dart's time, of what the block would have looked like that the original Tong child came out of. Uh, here you can see what probably Raymond Dart would have seen, which is the back of the skull and what he described as this very clear mushroom shape. And we'll get to that a little bit later, and the bottom of the jaw. So he had a pretty good idea that there was a face inside of this concrete-like breccia block. Um, he would go about remarkably preparing this block from November to around December 21st with a pair of his wife's knitting needles and this hammer, which has remarkably survived. And here's Dart actually using this very hammer. He's preparing what looks like one of the early Makapanskat hominids. Now you can tell that because he's got the comparison of a Makapan hominid there in front of him. We'll be looking at the sample from Makapanskat in the near future. So as you see, the Tong child is in three pieces in front of me. It wasn't always like that. Uh, when Dart first saw it, it was of course, part of it was in this block and part of it was loose, and that would be this endocast. Um, this is what it looked like after preparation. Uh, after Dart had prepared it with those knitting needles, the face and mandible were actually fused. That would later be taken apart by Philip Tobias, and the brain case was alone. Can you imagine that moment when Raymond Dart, a comparative neuroanatomist, opened up a case that arrived from Tong and saw an endocast. Let's take a look at the discovery itself. The initial scientific announcement of the Tong child occurred on the 7th of February, 1925, in the journal Nature. Now, that itself is remarkable when you consider that he'd only seen the face on the 21st or so of December, and he wrote the paper describing this new species, Australopithecus, Africanus, Austral meaning southern in Latin, and Pithecus meaning ape in Greek, Africanus meaning Africa, so the southern ape of Africa. And he published it just a couple of months later in Nature. Now imagine that that had to go by mail train probably to the coast, then on a ship to London had to be reviewed and then printed with the methods of that day and published. A remarkable feat by, by any standards. It's actually not the first publication, though, 
of the Tong Child, uh, the Star newspaper here in Johannesburg actually headlined the discovery on the 3rd of February, uh, just a few days before. And there has always been some wonder whether that's what pushed the editors of Nature to uh, put the paper out so quickly. Not surprisingly, the announcement in Nature was not received with open welcoming arms by the dominant British Academy of Scientists, largely led by Sir Arthur Keith, Grafton Elliott Smith, uh, Sir Arthur Woodward, who not coincidentally uh, were part of what was known as the sort of Piltdown gang. They were the people involved with the scientific description of the Piltdown skull. Uh, the Piltdown skull had been discovered in uh, England uh, in, at a place called Piltdown, and it was the exact opposite of the small brain tong child. It had a large human-like brain and more ape-like jaws. Uh, it would later be proven uh, in the 1950s, around 1953, that the Piltdown was a fake and had an extremely biased world opinion on uh, the Tong Child. Now, to give you an idea, the kind of backlash that uh, Dart uh, received for claiming that he had a possible human ancestor in Africa, uh, there were statements like the fossil had little bearing on the issue of whether ancestors of man uh, are to be sought in Africa or Asia. Now, that's coming from the idea at the time that, that humans had a distinctly Asian origin, not some scientists even went so far as to suggest it was perhaps just a baby gorilla and that the Tong child would uh, bear little out on anything other than the origins of apes themselves. Uh, Broom did have his supporters, though. Uh, people like Robert Broom came forward. Uh, Philip Tobias used to tell a lovely story of Robert Broom bursting into Raymond Dart's lab uh, his office actually in Hillbrow Hospital uh, here in Johannesburg and falling to his knees in front of his ancestor. Um, I think these were all extraordinary characters at the time. Uh, eventually, the Tong child and the fossils that had been uh, discovered by then from places like uh, Cromdry and Sturkfontein were recognized for what they were. Uh, the big moment uh, scientific moment, if you will, uh, came when uh, Wilfred Legros Clark, who perhaps is one of the leading um, uh, scientists in, in this field of comparative evolutionary biology in its early days, uh, in early 1947, uh, said that he felt that the fossils from Southern Africa did bear direct bearing on the ancestry of humans. And in February 1947, uh, there was an anonymous paper, interestingly, published in Nature uh, that uh, told of Wilfred Legros Clark's um, January pronouncement that the Tong child was indeed a hominid. And literally that day, Sir Arthur Keith uh, recanted his position uh, and said that, that he had been wrong the entire time. A remarkable thing for uh, the sort of stuffy nature of, of science, and particularly English science, at that time. So let's start by looking at what Raymond Dart would have first seen. The first thing that he really noticed when he opened up that uh, crate arriving from Tong was this endocast. And it really was a remarkable thing that Raymond Dart was the recipient of that because uh, Raymond Dart was a comparative neuroanatomist and probably one of the few people in the world that would have recognized the real significance of this specimen. Now, firstly, what is an endocast? Well, an endocast is actually a, a mold of the inside of a skull. And it preserves potentially uh, features of the external morphology of the brain because as you are alive, your brain is effectively beating and molding a impression of the outside of its surface anatomy onto the inside of your skull. The younger you are, like the Tong Chao being very young, um, the better often those sulky and gyri are preserved. As you get older, it tends to smooth out a little bit as the skull hardens and 
other things happen. Now, to explain what happened in this particular case, because you have half of an endocast here, I brought along a chimpanzee skull to sort of illustrate this for you. So here you have the, the skull and the face of this chimpanzee. It's clear that the tong cha was lying on its side, something uh, like this, and sediment uh, from the cave infill that it was in entered the foramen magnum. This is this hole right here that your spine attaches to. It began to fill, but only filled halfway. So we, we kind of know where the floor level was, uh, and, and when it passed, it, it didn't fill up. So it was probably relatively dry sediment uh, that initially filled it, but that sediment would soon harden by lime. That would then preserve this, this just magnificent um, endocast. Now, one of the first things that Raymond Dart noticed was the this here, this area down here, which is what he interpreted as the foramen magnum itself, the the position where the spinal cord um, enters the skull. Now, that's a really important area because as we go back to our chimp friend here, um, in quadrupeds, and chimpanzees are quadrupeds, when I put the skull in, in something approximating the, the sort of Frankfurt horizontal position, which is about like this, in quadrupeds, the uh, foramen magnum is oriented slightly backwards because the animal walks on four legs. In uh, the case of chimpanzees, of course, they knuckle walk on, on four legs most of the time. And so the foramen magnum, if this was from an ape or a monkey or something very small, would have had the foramen magnum positioned towards the back. What Raymond Dart saw or interpreted was that this foramen magnum was actually very far forward um, in the position when you put the skull in its anatomical position of orienting straight down like this. So he interpreted that this as indicating, even though it was a very small brain, that this was a biped. Now, that was remarkable. No one had ever seen a biped that uh, had a small brain like this. All the discoveries to that, uh, uh, to that time in, in 1924 uh, had shown large brain hominids. A Piltdown Man, which of course was going to be a fraud, was, was, uh, had a huge brain. Um, the Java finds of, of Pithecanthropus or Homo erectus had very large brains, but here was a very small brain. And Dart could estimate the brain size very easily by dropping this into water and, and effectively doubling it, although, as you can see from this line, it's not a, a perfect um, a half of brain. You actually have a little bit more indicating the skull was positioned uh, downward sloping in the back a little bit, but he figured that the the brain size was between between about 400 and 500 cubic centimeters, so at least about a third of the size of a modern uh, human brain, um, which was very tiny. Uh, now studies have indicated, uh, more accurate studies have interpreted that this brain is likely around 400 to 410 cubic centimeters. Um, in size. So very, very small with an estimated adult size. That is, of course, this is a child, uh, and we'll talk about the age of that in a moment, uh, that would grow up to be approximately 440 to 450 cubic centimeters, um, the size of, of uh, a little bigger than a chimpanzee's uh, brain would be that you, that you see right here. So this endocast is is beautiful and remarkable. And I just want to point out some of the features. And by the way, it, the the science of examining these endocasts is is extremely difficult. And uh, scientists argue about the morphology of these things all the time. Um, but here are some things you can see on it. Uh, back here, you can see beautifully the cerebellum. Um, there's a huge argument over where the lunate sulcus is, but most people think it's this feature uh, that, that's right down in, in this area right here. Uh, the frontal sulcus is likely down in here. And so you can begin to interpret the anatomy of this. I, I just want to also take one quick look at the beauty of this specimen. I still think it's one of the most beautiful fossils ever found. I, I don't know if this light does justice 
to seeing the calcium carbonate crystals uh, that flash there as you, you look at the uh, calcium carbonate crystals that formed like little um, uh, stalactites and stalagmites on the interior of that skull. Remember that this was blasted free by dynamite and is lucky to be in this condition at all. Here's a good look at that mushroom-shaped feature that Raymond Dart saw and was able to correlate with with this feature, of course, as I demonstrated earlier this feature that he saw on the back of the block. After working with the hammers and chisels and knitting needles, um, this magnificent face emerged. Uh, can you imagine what Raymond Dart thought when he, when he uh, saw this face? Now, as I said, remember that the face, he didn't have a view of the dentition at the time, but he could see the sides of the teeth. And from that, a couple of conclusions were made. One was that this had a very small canine. Even for a juvenile, uh, this female chimpanzee, you can see as a relatively large canine, he could tell immediately that this had a smaller canine, again, a sign of uh, humans and, and other hominids even at that time. He felt that the enamel was thick, and he did, could see a couple of broken areas on here that uh, indicated that the enamel was uh, uh, actually... Uh, thicker than you would see in a chimpanzee. And that's another character of being a hominid. We have very thick enamel. Um, as we look at this magnificent face, you can see a couple other things. As I look at the jaw, you can see that the jaw is, uh, is not curved like you would find in a human. A human would have a, a broad, open U type shape. This has a very parallel shape, which is a, a primitive condition. Uh, but not as extreme as what you see in chimpanzees, for example. So, again, something leaning towards the, the human or hominid side. Um, so, let's take a quick look at the dentition of the, the Tong child. Um, these are all deciduous teeth, so we have deciduous central incisors and lateral incisors, the deciduous canines and molars. This is a permanent tooth here coming in, the, the M1, the permanent M1. Um, when you combine that with the dentition of the uh, uh, bottom and, and do modern studies like micro CT scans of this, there have been age estimates done that place the Tong child at about two and a half to three and a half years of age at death. So here you can see the, the magnificent fossil and here you uh, see the jawbone. They were, as I said, uh, reunited originally, and I'll do that for you in just a moment. I just want to point out something interesting that's sort of a tragedy that has occurred with this specimen. Um, you can see that, that the teeth have gaps between them. That actually, those gaps have actually occurred from scientists measuring this with metal calipers over the years. We can see from the original photographs of the Tong child that, uh, in fact, uh, its teeth were in much better condition now. So we no longer allow calipers like that uh, to be used on, on a specimen like this. Some other characters of this specimen, it has a very fo uh, small frontal lobe, um, and you can see here that it's not as developed as in humans. Uh, so what I'm going to do now, uh, just as a, a, a fun exercise, so you can all see this done. My mentor, Philip Tobias, used to do this with great glee, and I'm going to do it for you. So we're going to put all this back together and reunite this in a way that hasn't been done for a very, very, very long time. So first, we now have reunited the, the face and the endocast, and I will give you a look at that, the classic image of the Tong child itself. And then let's see if we can get, without doing too much here, the jaw aligned. And there we can put the jaw back together like it has been when it was discovered. And here you can see now the jaw on the Tong child. It's an interesting thing about this specimen is uh, that uh, we don't really know the location from where this specimen was discovered. Surprisingly, even though he recognized the importance of the Tong child, Raymond Dart didn't go immediately to the Tong site to actually explore and see where the fossil skull had been discovered. 
Uh, Ali Herlichko was one of the first to go shortly uh, afterwards, uh, several months afterwards, in fact, uh, to the Tong site. Um, but all we really have are some grainy pictures that were taken after the fact, often several years after the fact, with quarrymen who are indicating about where the skull came from. But it was pretty much consensus uh, from all those early visitors that the actual site where the skull was found had already been blasted away and destroyed. Um, attempts have been made over the past uh, many decades to locate the actual site. Philip Tobias uh, thought he had located the site and actually put a, a pyramid up at the site. Uh, people like Jeff McKee felt that the areas, the, the two pinnacles, one called the Herlichka Pinnacle, one called the Dart Pinnacle, um, were not the area that was actually outside of that. Excavations were conducted. Many baboon fossils come from these pinnacles, and here you can see a very uh, good image by Kuhn et al. of the, of the areas where uh, people think that the uh, fossil skull came from, but no one really knows. So there are many questions we might never know the answer to because we don't know exactly where the Tong Chao came from. But there are some questions that we think we can get close to answering. And one of those is, how did this little child die? Back in 1994, I was excavating alone at Gladysville one day, uh, a hominid site I discovered a few years earlier. And I was watching a troop of vervet monkeys playing together on the hill opposite. And suddenly they start alarm calling and a black eagle came around the side of the hill and they were watching it and running from it and leaping from tree to tree. But it, what it was was really an ambush because almost immediately a second black eagle came from the other side of the hill, swooped down and grabbed and killed almost instantly a large male vervet monkey. I was stunned. Uh, I didn't realize that large eagles like that were real predators of, of primates in that way, or at least I'd never thought about it at that time. And as the eagle watched me, I watched it, and then it did something even more amazing. It lifted this monkey, which must have weighed two to three kilograms, say five or six pounds, and flew down the valley, carrying this monkey off in the direction of its nest. Now, I knew where these two eagles nested, and so I got in my car, and I raced over there, and I climbed up underneath the nest, and there I found a bunch of bones, uh, skulls of monkeys, skulls of hyrax as a small uh, dossie, a mammal uh, in Africa, rabbits, bird bones, and all of them had these very characteristic marks. And almost immediately, my mind went to marks that I'd seen on fossil baboons from Tong. And I'd been pondering what the cause of the collection of the Tong fossils were. They're very different than almost anywhere else. The ones directly associated with the Tong child, at least from the original um, box that Raymond Dart had recovered, were all relatively small and dominated by primates. Race back to Vitz, I opened up the drawers that held these monkey skulls, and there were the same marks. I was stunned, these keyhole-shaped type marks. And that would lead me uh, to work with Ron Clark at the time we would publish in 1995 the hypothesis that a bird of prey had actually killed and eaten the primates that were alongside uh, the Tong child and possibly the Tong child itself. Well, a little bit later, uh, work by uh, scientists in Central Africa on uh, the prey of the crowned eagle, a much larger ferocious bird of prey uh, capable of killing animals up to uh, say 30 kilograms or, or 70 pounds um, and carrying off very large prey as well, uh, showed other marks, including marks that were in the orbits of the eyes of these monkeys. And when I saw those images, I was actually asked to referee a paper. I was blown away and because I, I realized that I'd seen those images too. I actually went down late one evening uh, to the vault at the University of Vitt-Waltersrand. It was then in the medical school, pulled out the Tong child, and there were those same notches in the orbit of the Tong child. And I knew that really we had the culprit for who killed the Tong child. So let's take a look at them. Let's take a look at some of that evidence for uh, um, what we interpret as predatory damage by a large bird of prey. 
I think for me, one of the most striking is, is this damage that occurs inside of the left so eye socket. There you can see these very jagged little areas in a very thin piece of bone. Now imagine that in the base of that orbit, that bone is paper thin. Um, for it to even have lasted is incredible, but that is very characteristic of how large birds of prey even today will go after a primate skull. Um, probably the chicks are doing this more than the adults, trying to get into the brain, because of course the brain is sitting right behind there and also just worrying for other parts of the, the meat that they can get to. Across the surface of this skull are these scratches, and some of them I believe you can even see, even in this light from this distance, scratches all over the surface. Again, a feature that is very, very characteristic of, of damage that's done as eagles uh, feed on the meat of the face um, with their talons and with their beak. Philip Tobias, uh, when we first came up with the idea of uh, the Tong child immediately ran in and, and grabbed the endocast again because he had all he and Raymond Dart had always puzzled over uh, this area right here. That may not seem like much, but it was an anomaly because what you can see across here and here are impressions in the bone, and maybe this part is actually better. You see this deep impression uh, that we can see here that's got actually bone pushed down into the brain. Um, that had confused Dart and uh, Philip Tobias uh, for a very long time, but of course that's a very characteristic kill point um, for large birds of prey. These large birds of prey, like the crowned eagle, have talons that are sort of 14 centimeters, or so kind of six inches in length, and they're razor sharp. And because primates are so dangerous, they have hands and grab onto um, the legs or wings or feathers of these birds. They try to kill them instantly, and they actually have killing talons that they drive into the brain, and they leave exactly this kind of mark. Um, on the on the skulls of monkeys and so with that evidence and the evidence of the monkeys that we actually uh, discovered and the nature of of the deposit and the damage on those monkeys themselves we interpreted that the tong child was uh, killed by a large bird of prey so the final thing to talk about is how long ago did the tong child live and the answer is we simply don't know we don't have the site anymore to directly date it. So we have to make estimates using the baboons that were found with it, as well as where other uh, specimens of Australopithecus africanus have actually been discovered, like Sturkfontein and Makapanska. And from that, we estimate that the Tong child lived between two and three million years ago. But until we can direct date this fossil, we may never know for sure. Well, that's all for this lecture and fossil show. Uh, I'll be doing others over the next weeks and months on things like Makapanskat and the osteodonto keratic culture, the Sturkfontein fossils, fossils from Swartkrons and Krom Dry, um, modern human origins, and of course, Sediba and Naledi. If you want to see any particular ones, you can just follow me on Twitter at Lee R. Berger, and you can actually message me there. Please like and share, or follow me on Facebook at Prof. Lee R. Berger. Um, I've enjoyed talking to you today. Uh, the Tong child, uh, the holotype of Australopithecus africanus, now has to go back into its secure facilities. Everyone out there, be safe, be healthy, and remember, keep washing your hands. Goodbye from Johannesburg, South Africa, and the University of the Witwatersrand.